Okay, welcome everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. Today's webinar is Five Lessons from the 2020 Financial Turmoil. My name is Sean McKay, and this is an American IRA presentation. Although it's a very different type of presentation than what we normally roll out, uh, typically we're talking about very specific strategies as they pertain to these self-directed accounts. Uh, but I thought that it was kind of helpful if, if we uh, articulated some of the things that we heard from our clients over the 2020 year, things that worked, things that were a challenge, so that hopefully we could all kind of go to school on those concepts. Certainly a lot of the things we'll discuss today uh, will not be new ideas to you, but I think as with most things in life, when you get back to the fundamentals and you're doing those things well, especially as it pertains to your financial life, usually you end up getting pretty desirable results over the long period of time. So hopefully there'll be some value in there for you today. So American IRA is a third party administrator for your self-directed account. We have offices in Asheville, North Carolina, as well as Charlotte, North Carolina. Uh, certainly, please keep in mind that the information discussed today uh, is just simply for illustrative purposes about financial concepts. We are not advisors, CPAs, or attorneys, so it is always prudent to discuss those appropriate ideas with those professionals so that you can make an informed decision in your investing. So when you think about us in comparison to other self-directed providers, to me, there are kind of typically two distinguishing features between our firm and other firms in the industry. And the first one is the fees associated with our service are incredibly cost effective. Uh, historically, what you see is one of two models for other self-directed providers. Either their annual fee is based upon the value of the account, so what that means is as the value of your account grows, so does your annual fee, or they have a number of assets annual fee concept. So for each additional asset, it's usually about $300 in terms of an additional annual fee component. So if you have, let's say, four assets, for example, you're going to be looking at $1,200 a year for your self-directed annual fee. Our, our thesis is that it's it's unfair it's there's a different way to provide services to self-directed accounts because since they are self-directed accounts we are not making investment decisions for you so we really shouldn't get to see the upside as you're growing your account from 50,000 to 100,000 to 200,000 etc so our annual fee for our IRA is fixed at $285 a year also, the second component to uh, what we believe differentiates us from the other providers is just simply the quality of our operations team. Uh, we have a phenomenal team. Uh, many of the team members have been with us for eight, 10 plus years. And so ultimately, we're really proud of the service that they're able to provide. We have phenomenal online reviews. If you go to the Better Business Bureau, to Google Reviews, to any of those platforms, uh, you see a lot of great feedback in terms of clients being willing to share their experience in working with American IRA. So we're very, very proud of that. We got a phenomenal team. So we're going to go, excuse me, we're going to go ahead and just dive right into it. Uh, so the first concept is the idea of diversification. And so we all hear that, especially when it pertains to our investments, that we want to be really diversified as it pertains to our IRAs, our 401ks. We don't want to have all of our money in an individual investment. We don't want to have all of our money in an individual uh, sector, let's say, in the stock market. We want to have diversification. And so one of the things that seemingly worked very well for our clients this year that were diversified is having investments in completely non-correlated asset classes. So by that, what we mean is that we have clients that are certainly very strong in terms of their alternative asset portfolio. They might have some rental properties. They might have some precious metals inside of their retirement accounts. But they were balancing that with other types of investments that their IRA or 401k held. So they might also have some index funds that are tied to the stock market. Maybe they invested in a privately held business. So when we have a very turbulent financial year as we had in 2020, that allowed them to still 
retain a lot of their net worth in their retirement account because obviously the stock market had a really tumultuous year. There was there was a pretty steep drop in the spring before it came back up. Unfortunately, there was a lot of panic selling as the prices were dropping there. But it's a little bit easier to stand pat when you know that you have other assets that have actually not decreased in value for that year. So for example, precious metals, uh, gold had a had a pretty good year. Year. Real estate had a great year as a general asset class. Most markets, the prices of real estate actually went up. And so that diversification idea is really critical for us as investors to not just kind of understand theoretically, but as much as possible, try to put into practice. And uh, certainly keep in mind, I'm not preaching here today. I'm, I'm certainly doing my best actually to do a little bit better job moving forward little by little of diversifying. I've been way too heavy in real estate for the last, uh, boy, like maybe 19 years now, actually. So uh, I'm actually needing to diversify outside of real estate a bit more as, uh, as I'm too heavily concentrated in that asset class. So we all we, we can all learn from these things, and I'm, I'm certainly nobody special. I'm not somebody with answers, but we get a lot of great feedback from our clients. So lesson number two is cash is king. So Again, certainly when you have a year like 2020, it can be a scary year, certainly with the health concerns, with businesses shutting down. There's a lot to think about, a lot to juggle. But we did see a significant amount of our clients that were holding a fair amount of cash inside of their IRA or 401k looking for the next opportunity that they thought made sense. So if you had that cash on the sideline and we saw that pretty significant drop in the stock market again last uh, late spring, early summer, that was a that was a time period where we actually saw a lot of our clients' assets starting to go into the TD Ameritrade platform so that they could purchase individual stocks, they could invest in mutual funds, index funds, whatever they thought was appropriate, they could directly log in and they could take advantage of those opportunities. Now, even though the real estate market overall, at least in the Carolinas, was very strong, there were individual opportunities where the landlord was uh, over levered. We'll talk about that where there was opportunities to take advantage of a specific real estate deal or a new startup company that looked like it could maybe solve some problems that were associated with the pandemic. Those were opportunities that if you thought they made sense, you could deploy your cash into those opportunities and perhaps do really well with that. So lesson number three, I call the tortoise and the hare. And really this is just a idea that has become more and more clear to me as I've certainly made mistakes in my investing, as I've had the opportunity to learn from so many investors and entrepreneurs over the years. I think today's uh, world that we live in with social media, with all the ways to articulate how well you're doing has caused in some ways a little bit of a negative environment, especially for those that are just starting in their investing career, where there's so much of an emphasis on the scale of what you're doing and how quickly you're doing it. I think the, you know, kind of the, uh, that, that fable that we hear about the tortoise and the hare can be really beneficial in understanding that you don't have to, if you're involved in real estate, go out and buy 10 properties your first year or 50 properties your first year. There are these platforms where they kind of glamorize this idea of building these massive portfolios very, very quickly. And obviously that can cause a number of issues. When you're just getting started, you don't know what you don't know. You don't know uh, the, the pros and cons of different investments that you're looking at. So if you go so quickly into a specific strategy, you might not be prepared for the downside. You might not have the experience to kind of work through the ebbs and flows of that different asset class or whatever the case may be. So I think the idea of starting a little bit slowly, of having an experience with an investment to understand if it's appropriate for your portfolio. You might think that dealing in properties that are lower price point houses in your community might be a great way to maximize cash flow. You, you look at your Excel spreadsheets and you think to yourself, this is the way to do it. This is how I'm going to get the most 
return on my investment capital. But you, you could have a great experience with that. That could be the answer to your kind of financial journey. Or you could find that those properties have some challenges as it pertains to the types of tenants that you're attracting. Maybe you're finding that there's more turnover. Maybe it's tougher to collect rents. Uh, you know, it, it could go well, it could go poorly. But if you've purchased 40 of those houses, that's a little bit difficult to pivot away from if you're looking to investigate some other opportunities versus if you bought one or two of those houses, you had an experience for a couple of years and you saw if that really kind of gelled with your lifestyle, what you were trying to accomplish, et cetera. So again, I'm never trying to impress upon anybody listening to this, my idea of what a good investment is, who cares, I'm just another investor. But I think definitely going slowly allows you to uh, be able to understand where you're going, if it makes sense, and if you need to do a hard pivot into another type of idea. And so lesson number four, the idea of we'll never have a crystal ball is something that, again, I think we all inherently appreciate as a general concept, whether it's our financial life, our personal life, um, you know, very few things in life are permanent or have any ability to uh, or inability to be maneuvered in some way. But 2020 was certainly a situation where very few people thought that a worldwide pandemic would be the cause of some financial hardships for many people, of loss of value of some of our assets. Certainly, we've had a great bull market for many, many years. And so uh, I don't think there's necessarily a surprise that there was some sort of a a pullback, but a pandemic itself being the catalyst for that pullback, it was really kind of a surprise, certainly to me, and I think many, many in investors and just, you know, just as a community, I think that that was very surprising for the vast majority of us. I think also, as we talk about this idea of moving a little bit more slowly in our investing career, I think also when we look at what, what the what happened in this pandemic, it was surprising the way some of these things unfolded. I think that if you had started the year and you said there's the potential for some assets to pull back in terms of value, uh, I don't know if it would have been the majority, but certainly a fair amount of the investment community would say, yeah, we've had a great bull market. That certainly seems as though there's going to be some reason for a pullback in asset value. But if you said that the pandemic would be so significant that the uh, World Health Organizations, the governing bodies, uh, the CDC, the uh, governmental agencies would state that uh, due to the pandemic, it would be inappropriate for landlords to be able to evict tenants that are not paying rent. I think that would have certainly surprised more people because of that situation. So really, as we look at it, that also brings me back to some of the things that we've already discussed in terms of cash is king, having cash on hand to be able to deal with financial issues. If you're levered up on a real estate portfolio, having cash around to kind of get you through these tenant potential non-payments is certainly really critical. Uh, so this all kind of ties together as we can see. So understanding that we can always make projections as to how we think the economy is going to play out, how we think our portfolio is going to play out. Uh, but one of my, one of my friends, one of my best mentors, Chad Carson has done a phenomenal job of always sharing with us this idea that we can do the research, we can put in the work, but at the end of the day, these are really almost just kind of educated guesses that we're making as investors. And there's any number of possibilities of outcomes that we can have associated with uh, the reality of how these things play out. So we'll never have a crystal ball. And lesson number five is debt. And so, you know, we, we hear it all the time. Debt can be problematic. You don't want to have debt. Uh, debts, you know, depending upon your religious beliefs, may be something that you absolutely should not have in your investing. But ultimately, for certain asset classes, such as real estate, debt is a very typical instrument that allows people to get into the real estate world. Most of the time, people do not have hundreds of thousands of dollars in cash 
in their savings accounts or in their retirement accounts at the beginning to be able to get involved in real estate deals. And so the idea of using mortgages is usually a pretty typical structure that we see. With that being said, certainly all debt is not created equally. So as we think about debt, I think first and foremost, the length of debt can be a really significant factor in how dangerous your portfolio is and how susceptible it is to issues such as a 2020 pandemic. And so when I see rental portfolios where they are not only highly levered, but they are on these very short-term loan structures, that can be very scary because if you have a 12-month period in order to pay off that loan or to get a new form of financing, and then something like a 2020 scenario comes along and it gets very, very difficult to get loans, especially during the meat of the pandemic, that can be really scary, uncomfortable, problematic. And so that's a precarious position to put yourself and your portfolio in. So ideally, the longer the period of fixed debt, the better. So those investors that are getting 30-year fixed debt structures are typically going to be in a uh, safer position than those that have, again, those 12-month or those 24-month calls on those debt instruments. Certainly, the interest rate associated with the debt is a factor as well. For those that have the hard money payments that are in the double digits, certainly there can be a place in your portfolio to make the acquisition of the asset, or if it's going to be a transactional type of deal, like a fix and flip. I understand that investors use those tools, but if that's your, your takedown money to buy the deal, and then you'll kind of figure out the long-term debt at a situation down the road, uh, again, that can be really scary carrying those heavy, heavy debt payments each month as, again, maybe the property is not producing any income or even if it's a rental property, the tenants are struggling because, again, so many people have struggled during this period. That can be really challenging. So I think this also really ties in with the idea of the tortoise and the hare concept that we discussed earlier, where if you're going a little bit more slowly, that gives you more time to uh, be able to extract cash flow from your current rentals so that you can then use that money perhaps towards future down payments on additional rental properties. So maybe you're not growing your portfolios quickly, but you're doing it in a way where you have to use less and less leverage as you go through your acquisitions. And for many people, Again, Chad Carson talks about this idea of plateaus in your investing career where, you know, we all like the idea of growing, 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 but there's there's life that happens. Maybe your kids are a certain age where you're really involved in their sports and extracurricular activities and you don't have as much time to devote to new acquisitions. Maybe you're able to use that cash to pay off existing debt so that you're even further uh, solidifying your portfolio when these kind of hopefully unusual situations of pandemics arise and kind of make things a little bit trickier. So, you know, it's just uh, just some things to think about as we're going through our investing. Again, this is a very different type of webinar than what we currently do. Um, hopefully there's some value in there today. For anyone that's listening live to this, if you have any questions, any thoughts, if you just want to tell me to stick with the basics of self-directed accounts, I certainly appreciate that as well. Feel free to type into the questions box and uh, we can read any of that out loud. Again, I'm Sean McKay with American IRA. Uh, my email is sean, S-E-A-N, at AmericanIRA.com. Our website is AmericanIRA.com. Our phone number is 828-257-4949 or toll-free 866-7500-IRA, which is 472. All right, we'll open it up and uh, see if we have any thoughts or questions or what have you. So, uh, so it's an interesting question, uh, one that that's... Uh, everyone's going to have a different response to. But the question is, historically speaking, what might be considered some of the safer asset classes you have seen your clients invest in? So um, 
it's a great question, and, and I'm going to kind of paraphrase an idea that uh, Warren Buffett has shared over the years, which I think is is appropriate for a lot of uh, scenarios when we're thinking about our investing. And uh, the quote goes something like, and again, it's kind of a paraphrase, but the idea is uh, risk comes from not knowing what you're doing. So I think as we all look at our strengths and weaknesses, they're, they're certainly going to be different for all of us. So for those that spend a lot of time in the real estate world, uh, maybe you are learning from other real estate investors in town. Maybe you work in that industry as a realtor, a mortgage broker, an appraiser. You have knowledge about the real estate asset class. That can make real estate a reasonable investment, I think, in most people's minds to start to investigate as an investment. Um, certainly the, the challenge with real estate is that there is usually a lot of leverage used at the beginning if you don't have a huge base of capital to start with. So that can certainly add to the risk. Uh, there's been a lot of statistics that the majority of first generation wealth comes from ownership of real estate assets. So it's one of those things where the great thing about something like real estate is if you just simply purchase a good asset, a good piece of real estate, it's income producing. Producing, you're not using a lot of leverage and you're able to hold on to it for a long period of time. Historically, that works out well for people. Um, I actually would argue the, the lack of liquidity associated with the real estate investment, the fact that it takes longer to sell in different markets, it can be more challenging. I think from a long-term wealth building perspective, that's actually a benefit. I think the problem with the stock market and especially with the no commission world that we live in today is that I am certainly somebody that makes a lot of bad decisions in the stock market, not because the stock market is necessarily more dangerous or riskier than real estate, but it is just so much more easy. It's so much easier for me to log into a TD Ameritrade account and make some trades of buying or selling of assets just because of an idea I've had that morning and I can easily execute that in a couple of seconds. And then maybe a couple of days later, or a couple of weeks later, I realize that that was not a well thought out idea and then I need to exit that position. I may or may not make money on that. So, you know, when you look at the really successful investors, they tend to be in the camp of wanting to do things in a methodical way and not bouncing in and out of investment. So the short answer is, that I don't know if there's a specific asset class. When we're talking about safe assets, I think that bank products are going to be your safe assets, your CDs, your money markets, products like that. The problem is they don't give you any rate of return. So um, ultimately, the safest asset is the asset that you understand, that you have some knowledge of. Ideally, you have, as Peter Lynch would say, an edge in that investment or that asset class. That's going to make it the safest for you. And then again, hopefully you don't have to use a lot of leverage to make that type of investment. Uh, so the next question is, what is your outlook for 2021 uh, for real estate investing? So I appreciate the question. I appreciate that you think that I'm somebody worth uh, weighing in on that. I would say uh, I'm certainly not. I think that what we know about the real estate market is that interest rates are certainly historically very, very, very low. Um, so that has certainly helped to to be a rising tide for asset prices as we know real estate markets are all very different and so i think it depends certainly so much on the market that you're investing in so for example there might be uh, a lot of markets that are in more rural areas or in areas that are depressed there's there's jobs leaving, the population is leaving. And so I think that that can be a really challenging market, whether it's 2021 or 2025. You know, certainly with population growth, with job growth, you're going to see uh, a rising tide in that market. We're incredibly fortunate. I live, work, and invest in the Charlotte, North Carolina market. And, you know, based on magazines and, and uh, a certain opinion from some financial blogger. It's considered uh, one of the better markets. We've certainly seen a lot of appreciation in our market. 
will that continue? Uh, will the appreciation continue? Who knows? I certainly don't know. I think that it's it's a time to again, you know, I'm 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 just one of those people that tries to follow smart money, smart people, smart ideas, and uh, you know we've many of us have heard about the Warren Buffett ideas about um, when others are fear, fearful, be greedy. When others are greedy, be fearful. Uh, there does seem to be a lot of enthusiasm for all assets right now. Money is very cheap in terms of borrowing and, and creating debt instruments. So, you know, you'd have to think that uh, sooner or later, things will at the very least level off. If not, there will be a pullback in other assets such as real estate. Um, but we all have different preferences. We all have different uh, game plans as, as far as what we're trying to accomplish. For some people, it's I don't like my day job, and so I want to build a base of cash flow from rentals, and I'm not going to be concerned about net worth. So in that scenario, I would say you're certainly looking for deals that make sense for your portfolio. You're looking for a certain return on your investment dollar, uh, cash flow, net cash flow from rentals. In that scenario, I think you're going to be less concerned about a pullback whether it's tomorrow or five years from now, in the value of that rental property, if your plan A, B, and C is to just simply keep it as a rental property, I think you're going to be much more interested in the population growth and the job growth, making sure that the rents are going to, at the very least, keep up with inflation moving forward, if not exceed the rate of inflation. Um, I do like real estate, certainly as a hedge against inflation, being a, a hard asset, uh, historically, that has has been a, a nice tailwind for real estate investors. Uh, but, you know, I think that it's also going to be deal specific. We're seeing a lot of deals that are selling at very optimistic cap rates. So if you're familiar with real estate, the commercial end of real estate, the value of a property is based upon a cap rate, which is basically just another way of saying, if you were just simply to pay cash for this asset, what would be the, the yield on your investment dollar? So the higher the yield, the better the investment is from the buying perspective. So you'd rather buy a 10 cap versus a five cap, for example. Um, in the Charlotte market on the residential end, which typically uh, is a little bit of a different animal as far as cap rates go, the one to four units, um, when you're even looking at duplexes, triplexes, quads, it's, it's an interesting indicator of how optimistic the marketplace is. Uh, we've seen properties that are selling at three caps, which is low. It's very low, even with the interest rates being what they are. So it seems as though rents are going to need to increase in order for the price appreciation for those assets to increase. Or maybe we're going into an inflationary period where the value of all assets is going to significantly improve over the years to come, uh, just again, as a factor of inflation. So there's a lot going on there, and uh, sorry I've been rambling on for a long time, but you know I, I feel like I'm surrounded by my fellow financial nerds, and I mean that in the most positive and respectful way. So uh, I love I love these types of um, ideas. I like to usually be the one asking the question, but uh, thank you for your your thoughts. Not sure that really gave you much, but just kind of the way that. Uh, my wife and I are kind of thinking about our investment portfolio. Again, these are not quote unquote American IRA ideas, just just another investor that's uh, sharing their thoughts and feelings and, and also what they're getting from other investors. So thank you for that question. All right. looks like uh, nobody else wants to hear me go on another 10 or 15 minute <laughs> tangent. So I do appreciate everyone attending today. Thank you all so much. And uh, again, let us know if this type of content is of value to you. We can certainly roll out uh, content that's not so much geared towards a specific strategy, such as rentals, wholesaling, um, you know, tax liens, et cetera. If you want kind of more macro discussions, please let us know. And uh, again, thank you all for your time today, and we will see you soon. All right. Have a great day, everyone.